Hi, I am Ambika Bum, and I am a recovering outcome addict. I want to start off with asking all of you guys, how many of you are, let me start sharing my screen real quick. How many of you are also very outcome driven? So if you could log in on slido.com and use this event code and answer this question. I'm curious of all the people who are out there, how many of you are also very, um, or have been focused on wanting to achieve X, Y, Z, whether it's a certain grade or a certain um, stature, a job, how do you consider yourself? All right, this is interesting. So in high school, whenever I was younger and at NYJ, I was very much like this. I um, joined the tennis team and I wanted to win games and then become captain. When I was part of debate, it was about taking the team to nationals, um, getting good grades to become valedictorian. Everything was about you know achieving something because at that time, a lot of the philosophy that I've been hearing about was being goal oriented. So it sounds like many of you are also in that, or have been in that mindset. So what kind of outcomes do you desire? What are the things that all of you have been aiming for? If you could also submit on this next question. <laughs> the perfect job, I can get that. <laughs> Success, that is a great thing to aim for, but what does success mean to you? I'm finding it very interesting that many of you are, are talking about more um, esoteric responses here. That's great. You're already beyond where I was necessarily. Um, college, <laughs> acknowledgement. Well, um, I appreciate all of your feedback. Like I said, I um, was, it was kindly introduced by Disha with my, back, with my uh, bio, and I have to say, when you just hear that, it sounds like that I'm like the champion of being an outcome addict. Um, but what I'd like to really share with you today is what I've learned in my, in looking back at the last 15 years, about how to actually obtain outcomes by not being focused on the outcome and by being focused on the path that takes you there. So my plan here today is to talk a bit about what my um, path has been, what I currently do, and then at the end, allow for some time for you guys to ask questions so it can be more relevant to what your experiences are. I'm going to um, now switch over to telling you about, give me one second to switch screens here. So what do I currently do? I am at the moment the Health Science and Technology Advisor to the Crisis Management and Strategy Office of Department of State. So this is a very complicated looking graph. Um, and the point is, is that it's complex. The Department of State is a very hierarchical um, department with a lot of different offices and bureaus. Um, and of the different government agencies I've worked in, it is very hierarchical. Where you are on this um, chart does affect um, how quickly you can obtain results and get permissions granted. Crisis management strategy sits in the bureau or the office of the secretary um, in the operations center working with the executive secretariat. And it was originally established in um, 1976 with only three people. And what they were doing at the time was really transcribing events as they were unfolding in different emergencies at that time. Today, the office is about 20 people. Um, split between foreign service and civil service um, officers. So foreign service officers rotate across the world in different posts, um, and including here in, in DC, where we are based in civil services, people tend to be more institutional knowledge for the office. Um, the way I think of crisis management, this particular office is kind of like the lifeguards on the beach. They're keeping an eye out on the ocean, looking for waves, looking for um, high tide coming in and warning everyone on what's going on and being able to get that information very quickly to the senior leaders, the Secretary of State and, the, and their direct um, uh, deputies um, because of being on the same floor with them is a big part of it. Uh, over the last 
10 years, there have been 125 evacuation um, situations and as many um, where there were no, the crisis was averted and evacuations were not needed. I um, joined this office in December. So it's been seven months, but honestly it feels much longer because everything that has unfolded. Um, and I would have to be um, honest in admitting that part of what motivated it was um, my love for this one particular TV show, Madam Secretary. And honestly, the first weeks of me starting on the stop felt like being in that TV show. Episode two of season one of Madam Secretary is about an embassy getting attacked. Week three of my day on, of my starting this job, because it was the last week of December, um, a lot of the office was out of town on holiday, I was actually given charge of managing one region of the world, which is the Middle East. And on my day one of being in charge of that area, um, rockets were shot and American citizens were killed in Iraq. So that launched um, immediately into what turned into attacks on the embassy in Baghdad and a task force starting. So this office is known for being the center for task forces. And you can think of a task force kind of like a mission control room where all the relevant players are all present in the same room. And it's the center from which information is funneled and decisions are, are made from that information, but also then dispersed out to all the different fact players, whether it's interagency, meaning like with other departments and other parts of the government, or whether it's with people out in the countries, whether it's our people on, at embassies or interacting with officials in that other country. And so all that's funneled through a task force. Day two of me being in charge, we were launching a task force and one of my colleagues was like, you're bringing bad luck to the office. <laughs> you broke the system. And it turned into a really interesting um, scenario that led to an airstrike killing of um, Soleimani, who is the second most powerful man in Iran. Um, that assassina assassination was the boldest um, U.S. attack in confronting Iran since 1979. Um, and it was at the precipice of what could have turned into um, a shooting war with Iran. And for that to be the first few weeks of being in the office was kind of jolting for me. My background previous to this, had, which I'm going to kind of circle back to, has been very academic. It's been in science, it's been in running a startup related to biotech, and it hadn't been this particular experience. And it was so fast moving and essentially it was like a, a hazing experience to learn how does stuff get done in the time of a crisis? How is information coordinated and how does everything move along? Fortunately, the country's backed off and we didn't end up in any kind of a, a shooting war. Um, but at that same time, guess what else was popping up? COVID. My um, background being more in the health direction and I was the first this was the first time that they created this position in, in um, crisis management to have someone with a health science and technology background to be an advisor in the office. Um, so within, um, within the first couple of weeks of coming in, what I was starting to do was look at how do you track and monitor health um, outbreaks in different places and COVID started popping up. Um, so the day that we shut down the task force for the Middle East, the next day was the launch of a task force to evacuate people from Wuhan. And seeing all that playing out in the first couple of weeks was really, really eye-opening. Um, my role in it became answering a lot of questions and diving into providing information on what the scientific community, the NIH, CDC, was really understanding and the WHO on what this disease is. How is it spreading? What does it mean? How can we detect it? And all that translates then into Department of State and into interagency meetings about what do we do to stop it at our borders, um, and and, then, and how do how do you come about thinking about decision making at that point? It was the disease wasn't considered to be human to human translate um, tr transmitting, and as things were evolving, a lot of my job was to interpret information so that then non science folks could start making some decisions on how they want to handle things. Um, and a lot of things played out over the next few weeks that were frankly historic. Um, starting off with, from the Department of State's view, so the Department of State is very focused on the global, global facing side of everything, not on the internal domestic side. Um, and it began with travel advisories. Um, 
there are usually four levels of travel advisories and number level four is rarely put into place. There are only a handful of places and um, sending out counselor alerts to all citizens and people who are signed up to get this um, alerts in the different locations. Records were broken on all these things. And the first three months, 21,000 counselor um, alerts were, no, sorry, 3,000 counselor alerts were sent out. And in the entire history since 2004, when a lot of this was being tracked, um, there have only been 21,000. So you can imagine how much information was trying to be pushed out to everybody to keep everyone as informed as could be. And then that led to travel advisories. Um, never before had there been a travel advisory for the entire world, a global travel advisory level four for just don't travel anywhere in the world. And then another never before happened, a travel advisory for the US of level four, don't, ever, don't travel within the US. That's also something that Councilor Affairs and Department of State had never done before. Another thing that they'd never done before was travel to put in place a travel ban to a country like China, where so many of our um, economic business interactions, political, to ban such a large country's um, ability to travel back and forth was a, a new decision that played out and then led to what ended up becoming the next um, four months of a huge massive effort, which was a global evacuation, which had historically also not been done to the scale before. So we had American citizens and you know their relatives and whatnot all stuck in different parts of the world who could no longer get on flights because commercial flights had been canceled and they needed to get back. So it became this massive challenge of how do we help everybody get back home. And it was also never before been a situation where crisis management was trying to deal with a crisis in a part of the world that was also affecting people locally. So the same concerns about social distancing and disease spread and how to manage that locally. Task forces are usually like one room. Everybody's like right next to each other yelling and screaming at each other. Um, we had to set up a system for how to do this virtually. And if you've got any experience of working in government, particularly Department of State, they're not as, they're slow to adopt new technologies. And so getting everyone to immediately start working on Microsoft Teams and having a virtual task force set up this task force ended up having more than 400 people involved in coordinating all the efforts because there were no you know, flights to places, flights had to be char chartered. It involved coordinating with governments there to get permissions to land and go. It required visa situations for each individual to be understood. It required understanding health safety for the travel and for you know, even Department of, of State employees who were out on the field. And so um, this was really something that was an effort that had never been done before. More than 7,000 inquiries from, from senators and congressmen were coming in that needed to be responded to. There was a lot of attention to all of this. And um, what was nice about it is this was one thing that was very clearly bipartisan. Everyone was on the same page that we needed to help folks. Um, and Actually, even a few weeks ago, I think it was on June 11th, the Senate ended up signing um, a resolution with unanimous support from both sides, commending the work that was done by this office. And so it's, it's been like this whirlwind of, of, it, of um, activity in the past few months to see all of this happen, so many historic things, and to imagine how, how such a large bureaucratic organization can make so many things effective, it, it's been an really eye-opening experience. My role sort of at this point, if we have, a, we're always like monitoring for other kinds of crises. And at that point we jump into dealing with the task force. But in general, my advisory role is more um, going to be focused on developing a new plan for pandemic response for Department of State moving forward. There's currently a bill that has come out, the Global Health Security Act, um, where there is a proposal on how to better prepare as a nation um, and coordinate between agencies and and there's a significant component of Department of State um, in that bill being involved and having it headquartered out of Department of State. And so how this plays out and what will happen, I think a lot of my um, role is going to be involved in these components of things. Um, I am in here as an advisor for two years. So this is not a position that I, um, that is you know, a lifelong position. Um, but it's been super interesting, but how did I get here? 
Like, what even led me to all of this? I think when YJ reached out to me and I asked them, um, what did they want to hear about? It was about well, what is your career been and what have you learned in it? Um, and so I'm going to kind of backtrack now and go to the beginning. So in high school, um, I mentioned that I was involved in a lot of different things. Um, and while I enjoyed all those activities and I participated in them feeling like it's, it's for the benefit of my, like, broadening my experiences, whether it's sports or, you know, debate things or um, community service activities. I also knew in the back of my head, this is like building my resume for college. Um, and it wasn't like, it was a part of it. And, it, and you know, it, it worked. I did end up getting into a lot of colleges, but it was very much about this, like, I need to get these things on my list so that I can get to where I want to in college. Um, and I could, I was good at articulating why those plans were in place and where I was trying to go with it. But the reality was, is I kind of had intellectual ADD. I was interested in like so many different things and trying to figure out what was the career I wanted to have and where I was going to go with it. I liked medicine stuff in general. I liked engineering in general. Um, and I liked, because of debate and mock trials um, and using government things, I liked law. And I also liked econ because I had an awesome teacher in high school who really um, made an impact on me. And so I was like, I like all four of these things. Um, at that time, the degree of biomedical engineering was just like starting to become an undergrad degree. I mean, it's always been um, in grad school and research to do biomed research, but um, an official undergrad program was just starting to become a thing for the last like four or five years before I was gra graduating high school. And so I was like, I'm going to do biomed engineering because it combines two of those things and I'll do a minor in econ. So I've got three of the four things that kind of like wasn't a particularly well thought out plan. But um, what ended up happening is that um, I really enjoyed what I was learning in some of the earlier classes. Had. In the first semester, I took this peer-based learning class where you're not being taught stuff and then getting tested on it. You're given a problem and you have a team of eight of you. Go figure out how as an engineering team you would um, solve this problem. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. Just what would you do? And so like one of the questions was something like uh, mad cow disease. How do you contain it from spreading from one carcass to other animals? Um, because prions have this ability to keep on going and spreading disease quickly. And so we had to come up with a strategy on how to understand the disease is, come up with a way to contain it. And I just really enjoyed that process of like figuring out a problem that and how to solve it. Um, and so I just stuck with biomed engineering, but at the point, at that point, I didn't really understand what I was liking about it was kind of the innovation research part of it. Um, as I progressed through uh, my undergrad, I started doing some undergrad research and I had a really great mentor, uh, Dr. Barbara Boyan. I was wrapping, I'm preparing like one year before graduating, what do I want to do next? And I talked to her about, you know, I think maybe going into a biotech company and like leading it eventually would be like a direction I'm interested in. So what she did was connect me to former students of hers who were out in biotech industry. And the advice I kept getting was, is if you want to have real gravitas and leadership in a biotech company, you need to go to grad school, get a PhD, um, get some like cojones behind what you're, what you're trying to like preach on. And so I applied to grad school again, not because I had this passion for research, but just because it was like, okay, this is the ends to the means. This is where I want to, where I know where I want to go to. I was focused on the outcome and not like, because I love doing research or anything. Um, my strategy in life in general has always been that I kind of apply for a bunch of stuff see which ones I get, and then make a decision on what I want to do. And so I did that again here. I applied to a bunch of school and I applied to a bunch of scholarships that I didn't think I was going to get. Um, so I applied to the Marshall and the Rhodes, which are people who go to, to get Marshalls and Rhodes end up becoming like presidents. Um, they end up being chief justices or like on the Supreme Court or Nobel laureates and stuff like that. I didn't anticipate that I was going to fall in this crowd, but because I just tried, I ended up, um, I don't know, connecting to the interviewers enough that I got the Marshall Scholarship. And at that particular year, the Marshall was joining forces with um, a new program that was coming out of the National Institutes of Health. Um, so the National Institutes of Health is a research um, organization department um, from the government. It's not a university. 
but the NIH wanted to partner with scholarships in certain, and Oxford and Cambridge in particular to have students come in and do re research jointly between the UK and the NIH. Um, and so I ended up joining that program. So between the Marshall and the NIH Oxcam, um, I just ended up really falling in love with research and particularly in nanomedicine. And so just briefly, um, to know what nanomedicine is, you first have to know what nanotechnology is, and nano is 10 to the negative ninth or one billionth of a meter. And to kind of get perspective on what that means, if you think about the, the um, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and if you were to divide that by a million in length, then you get down to the size of an ant. If you take that ant, divide it by a million again, you get down to the size of a nanoparticle. And that's the range of kinds of, you're doing engineering, you're developing something, Thing on that scale and it's in the size range that can go into cells but it's larger than molecules so it can carry drugs and things like that as well and why I use nanotech for medicine is because the size range is ideal for having prolonged blood circulation so when you inject it if it's too large it clears out very quickly through the liver and if it's too small things clear out through the kidneys um, so nanotech which falls from like 10 nanometers up to maybe around 200 nanometers um, you can have prolonged blood circulation which allows for it to actually get to what you might be targeting. And because you can design the particle to have some imaging properties, you could potentially follow it along with delivering therapies. So if you combine therapy and diagnostics, you get theranostics. And so nanomedicine and theranostics was where I really became passionate and I saw that there's a lot of potential for it in a lot of in vitro, which is like in the lab kinds of studies, but also in patients. and an area that it can go into is knowledge-driven healthcare where you're getting a lot of feedback information as you're developing a therapy or treating the patient. And my work focused on developing a nanoparticle that had three different imaging properties that give you different kinds of information. And I was testing it in, in diseases related to autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis, along with looking at it in cancer models to show that it's a platform technology that can have applications in different places. I'm not really gonna go, go into the detail, but as I was wrapping up my PhD, um, you get to this point of like, now what's next? I've been studying for a really long time. Um, and what does this mean? Like, what am I gonna do with all this stuff now? So I'm going to read you this poem that um, my sister, when she was wrapping up med school, I think it's the head of her med school, read this poem and I, it conveys the feeling that you have at the end of grad school. It's a poem called Knots um, by R.D. Ling, there is something I don't know that I'm supposed to know. I don't know what it is that I don't know, and yet I'm supposed to know it. And I feel stupid if I seem both not to know it and not to know what it is that I don't know. Therefore, I pretend I know it. This is nerve wracking since I don't know what I must pretend to know. And therefore, I pretend to know everything. When you're a PhD, you're supposed to you have doctor in front of your name, you're supposed to know everything now. I know. I feel you know what I'm supposed to know, but you can't tell me what it is because you don't know that I don't know what it is. You may know what I don't know, but not that I don't know it, and I can't tell you. So you'll just have to tell me everything. Um, <laughs> if that was confusing, what it basically felt like was is that the more and more you're studying, you're getting all these academic and educational like uh, endeavors, you're becoming more and more of a master or this like, you have all this knowledge about less and less and less. So you're becoming this like expert on a really specific thing in the, in the world. And what you learn through all this education is kind of that education is a progressive discovery of your own ignorance. It makes you humble. You realize that there's so much out there. So now what do you do with the little piece and slice that you know? How do you take it forward in some significant way? Um, so as I was like wrapping up grad school, I was really, what I, grad school for me was a time of a lot of self-discovery. I learned a lot about what I enjoy, what I like to do, but I also was meeting all these incredible people. So the, my like um, other colleagues, I guess, other scholars and whatnot who were in this group were amazing people. These are people who like, one of them was the blind um, musician on American Idol after we left. Um, one of the girls she was studying CS previously, but she 
switched into a STEM education direction. And later on, she went on to found a company and is on boards of companies like Starbucks. Um, another person was really passionate about cybersecurity, and he ended up developing a department at Harvard for cybersecurity. All these people were high achievers who just made massive impact. Um, a person who was at Oxford at the same time as well on the Rhodes Scholarship at the time was Pete Buttigieg. So these were like, you know, people who had passion to really do something and they had a drive to make it happen. And what I really realized is, is winners and losers both have the same goals. You don't start off saying that I want to go somewhere different. They're aiming for the same thing. So what distinguishes them? And what I've found is that ordinary people focus on the outcomes and more extraordinary people focus on the process that gets them to those outcomes. Um, those extraordinary people, they gain satisfaction in the pursuit of, uh, of that. So when you're focused on the process and you're really excited about doing the work that you're doing and you're not so much thinking about, I'm trying to achieve this one particular goal, um, that joy itself becomes a learning, enhances your learning, it becomes faster and you start gaining experiences. So one of the first lessons I learned about myself was, um, was just how much I loved the discovery of science. Um, I was debating back and forth about whether to go to med school or not. And I went on this one medical clinic trip in India where we're seeing all sorts of cool diseases. But I realized on that trip that I loved the idea of learning about medical things in med school, but it would delay my time to getting back to doing real science um, and discovery and innovation. And there's this quote about if you light, if you brighten the light of science anywhere, you brighten it everywhere. And in, in this like idea of like contributing to knowledge that moves things forward, you don't get the immediate gratification of seeing the impact of it, but it's this bigger picture service that you're moving towards. And I really connected to that. And so I just became much more invested in doing research. And I decided to do um, a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute. As I was wrapping that postdoc up, I am, had intentions to move to California in October of that year. Um, in September, I was at a conference um, and the guy who was across from me giving a poster presentation as well, we ended up chatting about a problem he was having in his lab. Um, and I had this idea of like, what might be able to help them was nanotech related. And I was like, you know what, let me just come to your lab because he was also at the NIH next week and let me try something. September 22nd, I did a study where I was trying to basically get nano diamonds into trapped inside of a coating rather than trying to grow a coating on them which is what the field had been trying to do in the past and the diamonds came into solution and what that really did was <laughs> create like this new tool in the field of nanomedicine there are maybe like 10 or 11 nanoparticles that are then coated with all sorts of different kinds of coatings then there's hundreds and thousands of different kinds of targeting agents that are put on them that then go on to be used for all sorts of different medical applications so but the main toolkit is you know a handful of certain particles this introduced a new particle to that toolkit and i didn't do this with this intention of we're going to be like creating a new fabulous tool i just did it because it was fun and that changed the course of everything for me i ended up staying and joining his lab for another postdoc in the heart lung and blood institute our work led to a um, what's called the orloff award a technical achievement award by the nih for developing a platform technology that could be applied for all sorts of different diseases, and it eventually led to me launching um, Bicanta. So I was on this path where I could have gone into academia, um, but I felt motivated to instead do a startup because I felt like it would get this technology out into patients quicker if I could launch a company now with it rather than starting a lab at an institute and you know getting settled into that and then trying to do a company at the same time together. Um, and so I took this path that hadn't really, I didn't have any experience on. I didn't have any real understanding of what it would take, but I learned a lot in that process. And what I learned was less about academic intelligence, but a lot more about how do you get results? And I wanna share a couple of those lessons. Um, so because this technology briefly, I'm gonna skip this slide, um, allows for imaging through tissue um, a hundredfold better than conventional technologies that exist um, because of some unique properties that the nano diamonds have. And so we had, along with developing that imaging technique, had also figured out a number of different ways to code it and put targeting agents on the surface. And the first market we were going for was melanoma, a cancer application. 
So the targeting agents then allow you to then go after a cancer cell or, or whatever the target is that you're looking for. The idea is, is then you inject these particles into the bloodstream because they have a targeting agent on, agent on them, they go and put it on the tumor. Um, and because they're giving back this feedback, this signal that is detectable, you can do intraoperative procedures where you turn on these different lights, essentially that allows you to find the tumor and get better margins, cleaner lines, have better outcomes for patients. Um, technology. And so it was really exciting technology. And I felt really empowered that we were doing something that was very critical. But running the tech is very different than a lot of different factors that play into the success of a company. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that I learned. I'm trying to go a little bit faster because I want to have time for questions at the end. The first thing I learned is how you tell your story and what's going on. Um, you have to learn the art of that. So in science, you present slides like this, lots of data, lots of information. But if you're talking to an investor, you first tell them things, very simple words, three words. Get the main point across, not don't give them all the information. They don't need all the background. They just need the point of what you're going for. And you relate it to their end game, which is um, how are they going to make money off of it? So you put these like, really simple basic slides that make an impact. Um, but if you're talking on the other side, policymakers. So I was also involved in some nano policy work. There you talk about the bigger picture impacts it will have for society. And so you're talking about the same technologies. It's the same thing but how you present it is very different. So learning how to tell the story for the audience you're going to matters. In terms of success of a business, the total risk associated with the business is all sorts of things. It's related to business risk, legal risk, market risk, the technology itself, which is kind of the only thing you focus on when you're in academia. But all of that is actually compounded by the human risk. Who are the people who are leading it? Who are the people you're working with? Um, who push it through to get your first results and your first success stories. And your team is very much what drives that. So getting a really good team in place and having the entire team um, focused on kind of the mission, having a culture that supports everyone and that everyone believes in became a really important part at Become Bev. Um, and so this was kind of our company culture motto um, about being working with integrity. And you'll see that there's some links to Danism in this. This is about being honest and direct and set the like, showing data about what we're doing, not hiding it. Um, different companies behave differently about this, but this was what we all as a team felt. Having meaningful impact, you can work on all sorts of problems. There are so many options of things to deal with, but where can we have the most impact in understanding that, focusing our efforts there. Um, being action-oriented, having a generosity of spirit with everybody on the team, but externally as well, focused on innovation. And also, um, finally, empowerment um, for patients and for um, every, everyone we're interacting with. So our company culture is based on the idea of imagine. Um, and it also required definitely not just the team of who you have on your team internally, but who you work with and collaborate with um, because to get anywhere you, it's not productive to try to do everything yourself. Finding resources where you can is helpful because time is your number one resource and you have to prioritize what you yourself are focusing on. Um, and finally, one thing that was very clear was to be a sponge. When you are a startup or any company really, you need to be able to pivot as you're getting information and you're getting back feedback on what is working and what isn't. Um, in science, sometimes you can get very focused on what you're trying and you may not pivot as quickly, but as a startup with limited resources and with wanting to get traction, you need to be able to absorb and not be like so focused on what you're doing yourself. So long story short, Decanta was great, did wonderful for a long time, but um, when we were getting ready to prepare for clinical trials, Theranos happened. So Theranos was a diagnostic company that lost a bunch of investor money and then the whole investment community, VC community, kind of in general, diagnostics is a harder area to raise funds in, but it became almost impossible then. We were only able to raise about a fourth amount the money that was needed and in the end I had to make the decision to dissolve the company um, and so getting to a point where understanding what that meant was that failure or not and what it would feel like what I realized was I didn't feel bad about what we had done as a company we moved forward in technology which eventually the NIH took over and is continuing to develop but 
the part where I felt a lot of, um, I don't know, responsibility was is I had employees. Their livelihoods actually depended on us being successful. I also had investors who had put in money into the company and not being able to return their investment was something that I did not feel great about. Um, it turned out everybody in the company was able to real quickly land other jobs before the company had to dissolve. So that was great. But on the investment side, when I went to announce it to all the investors that were dissolving the company, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, and surprisingly, I was shocked with how much support um, and encouragement actually was received. There was only maybe one or two people who asked questions about like what this means, but multiple people offered me jobs after this. Um, and it was kind of um, a realization that being so honest and direct with everyone and being really focused on what we were doing as we were doing it, that sincerity not only obviously did it help with our own personal happiness, but it also connected with everyone we worked with. Um, from there, I realized that um, my skill set, something that I enjoy is thinking about the bigger picture and strategy and how are you getting to have the most impact possible. Oh, sorry. This is a quote I wanted to share that um, the experience of going through something where it could be a, you develop good judgment from experience and often experience comes from having had failures or having had bad judgment. And when you're at that point, then how do you move forward? Um, so what I realize is that we have a right to the work we're doing, the process that we're working on, but not necessarily to the outcomes. And um, I accepted that and kind of started moving forward with it. I ended up taking a position um, that was very graciously like created for me um, to work on nanotechnology policy and directions of science at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And I realized that I wanted to better understand how government can make things happen quickly um, and to get a government MBA kind of an experience. And that's what led me to the position I am at right now, was to see that in a time of a crisis, because you have all these resources at hand, but there's also bureau um, bureaucracy, how can you get things done? And I wanted to develop that skill and understanding. And where I ended up landing was here at crisis management. Um, just to kind of now thinking back at it all and looking at it in full circle. Um, in Jainism, we talk about this idea of a Nikon Prad. And the reason I'm bringing it up is, is usually, so this is a doctrine of non-absolutism. -absolute, Your anek means multiple or more than one. Um, and um, Vad and um, Anant means like aspects or attributes and Vad means theory. So it's ability to be able to see that there's multiple perspectives. Um, and we usually think about it when we're talking about interacting with other humans and having, taking in their perspectives and understanding that our truth is not everybody's truth. But the re one thing I realized in this past few years and looking back is, is um, I kind of was very pigeonholed at the beginning of looking at this is where I'm going and that's it. So I was kind of like a know-it-all for myself. It's, and Egon went you're not you're trying not to be a know it all for everybody else. But in some ways we do that to ourselves too. If we don't leave ourselves open to opportunities to really think about rather than thinking about the end goal and just being focused on this one direction of things, to instead allow yourself to be open to where possibilities can potentially be. Um, what it didn't really click in click to me that that's what I was doing um, because I was so focused on where I'm headed and what I'm gonna do. Culturally, I think as Indians and American Indians, we are prone to that a bit. It's this plan of go to undergrad, go to grad school, get a job, go up in the job, maybe get married, have kids. Like there's like this program of what we need to be doing. Um, and what I've learned is that but by being outcome driven, you're limiting your view and your ability to see the big picture. You accept, when you can accept that there's not just one view or that you may never know what the big picture is, you kind of open yourself up to, to more opportunities and taking more risks to, um, that can lead to leaps in your career. Um, in Anekantvad, um, to get Brahmanyan, which is like the complete knowledge, you have to look at both direct knowledge um, and indirect knowledge. So it's knowledge that you're learning from your experiences and external things, but also internally. And I guess where I wanna wrap up with, cause I'm kind of going a little quick here, sorry guys, um, is that 
how do you apply that in a professional setting? And so when you look at the theory of an econ thought, there's a lot of discussion on how you need to first develop a strong urge to seek the truth. But what it means in a professional setting is that first you have to be driven, you have to want progress and the truth or destination in your career really circles around not knowing what the, it's not about the material outcome that's gonna come at the end, but understanding what you are enjoying in the path of getting there. What is it that drives you that moves you forward? And for me, I've realized that a lot of it is about having positive impact. That's the kind of thing that really pushes me in my decision-making on career moves. Um, second, you need to believe in there's many possibilities. Um, the possibility of creatively applying developed skills and experiences can be beyond the obvious thing of where it makes sense what you're next, like usually you're trying to do some specific next thing, but those same skill sets could translate to something else. Um, don't insist that your way is the only one approach or the one thing you set out to can be enhanced by additional resources and things that you might try, um, except that there are partial truths and that you can't know what the final destination of what your career will be um, or how you'll feel about it once you even get there. Um, there's a lot of behavioral um, information research out there that people who are outcome driven, they get to the outcome and they have a high, a dopamine expression um, for a little bit. Um, that's great and it kind of dissipates. But if they're also outcome driven, the, the side, if they experience failure, the, the, just like the high of getting the, the result is short, the opposite of that is with failure. You end up feeling the negative feeling of it much longer. Whereas people who are focused on the process, instead they get joy throughout the process and the outcome itself doesn't really have that same longer term effect on them. Um, so if you can accept the truth, even if it is expressed by others, so that's number five on here, so you need to be open to feedback from clients and patients and um, advisors um, to help you think about what are the possibilities and accept that the truth can consist of all sorts of things that you wouldn't have thought of that might seem opposing. I think the thing I want to end with is that I've learned, I think there's this quote by Malcolm Forbes that education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open one. And what is that? That's an Um And so, with that, I appreciate all of you guys tuning in and um, I'm going to point you to Slido where you can send in your questions and Disha's gonna help um, connect us. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Bum. Uh, we're now going to dedicate some time to Q&A with Dr. Bum, so if you guys could just use that on Slido and you know bring in any questions you guys might have. Uh, but we can get started, there's already a couple of questions there. Um, so the first question is, in a role where crisis is often a part of the day to day, how do you maintain and like keep your composure throughout? Yeah, um, I think just in general, um, what I have found so much of this is about kind of how you mentally handle whatever is in front of you. To me, very honestly, this has been my easiest, less, most least stressful job. And part of it is, is because I, Whenever I was um, running the company, not that it was stressful, but there was a lot of responsibility and that pressure that I put on myself of wanting to fulfill those responsibilities was a lot more weighing heavy than necessarily here. Here, I feel like a part of a team. We're all handling crises and information is being thrown at you, but um, the entire weight of everything is not on my shoulders. And so um, it's about having healthy habits, about not... Um, you can't make it a personal thing. And when you're running a biotech startup or when you're doing your own research, it's a lot more personal. So for me, those experiences were probably a little bit more heavy wing than this particular role has been. Um, yes, it's a crisis, but there's a way to somehow kind of distance yourself emotionally from it so that you can remain composed and handle things. And, and also I have to say that this office is filled with amazing people. Everyone is just so productive, efficient, focused, and positive, it helps. So I think the aura and the leadership of the office is also a big part of that as well. Wonderful. Um, I think the second question is during and after your PhD, what skills did you focus on um, or do you think that helped you the most in the transition from academia to industry to government um, in general? Yeah, um, so I think the realization you have as you're moving forward, um, so for, let me speak for me, not in general. This is my perspective. Um, I was very academic, right? 
lot of school, a lot of getting good grades and like getting scholarships and getting PhD and getting good papers and whatnot. Um, and the more and more you realize that it's not about know like being able to spew out knowledge like traditional smarts, because frankly, the more and more the way the society is going, everyone will have information at their fingertips through their phone and internet anyways. It's about being able to translate and see how experiences that you've had before can be used in a new setting. So it's these analytical skills, these practical skills and experiences you have. Um, and so literally looking for opportunities to learn more of those and then apply them. Um, when I was doing my PhD, because it was a joint program between Oxford and um, uh, and the NIH, I actually ended up having four advisors. Usually in a PhD, you have one advisor. These are four advisors in four different institutes, four different like um, research backgrounds. There was an immunologist, an engineer, a um, imaging person, and um, a chemist. And so I was learning techniques from all of them, but it, what I learned also is that I have to kind of coordinate them and manage them. And how do you do that across time zones and different you know, priorities? Those skills translated very much into running a company. Company. Um, you're having all these pieces you're juggling and how do you translate that into that and it's super obvious now here in this role as well sometimes the different pieces that you're navigating and coordinating and how you're bringing them together are also different perspectives um, on how to manage whatever the crisis might be or a political perspective and how those skills of of people skills frankly <laughs> and um, I don't know, I don't want to call it managerial skills, but it's more like coordinating skills and getting people to realize a goal together. Those are things that in order to actually have the work you're doing have impact, those are a key component of it. And that's part of what I, why I decided to come to this job, even though it wasn't directly in the path of what I had done and what I had trained for everything. It was because I wanted to see how on such a massive level is that done? How do people do that and do it successfully? Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the last questions that we have is, uh, how do you manage being Jane or how do you think your Jane background has, you know, worked in when you have a department that has to take certain course of actions um, or just in like your research in general, how has that Jane background kind of stopped you or affected you in any way? So um, this is a great question. I, I would say that um, so Jainism has been a very big part of my life. Um, growing up, my family has been, I mean, it was a very personal experience for sure because we were kind of in a smaller community. My parents were the ones who we learned a lot from, but we had study groups with the families. We learned a lot about the scripture. I was always coming to Jainas and YJs and things. And so knowledge about what is there um, was a part of who I was. But as it came to applying it in life, I think what Jainism in general a lot of philosophy is, is how do you choose to apply it in your own life? You know, monks apply it in a different way than we would in our, as a lay person. And it definitely affected a lot of aspects of, as I was progressing. Initially, when I was doing research, it became a question of, am I comfortable with doing animal research? Um, ahimsa and all these other concepts, but I mean, think about it, so many Jains are doctors, a lot of all that came from research on animals as well. And where I came to within myself was that when I am making the decision on how the research is being done, I can be very clear on how we limit the numbers and then what we do and how we keep them in the, in, the, in the best, I don't know, the least painful way of doing things, but it will benefit a larger group of people. So I, there were questions I was asking myself a lot at that point. Um, I think now it's really interesting time to work in DC. There's a lot of divisiveness. There's a lot of anger. I knew when I was coming in, I'm coming in, I, no, it's not going to be shocking to know, <laughs> to think about where I probably fall in the political spectrum, given that I'm a science person. Um, but I wanted to see, like, how can you be in, in an environment where there are opposing viewpoints, and how do you still work towards a common goal, to get somewhere, to have some progress, to have something to work towards together. And coming to an agency which is all about diplomacy, it was something, the skill set that I wanted to understand. And I think for me, it has been a lot about Anik Anpad in all of this. How do you tie? So there have been different principles that I think have played a role in different aspects of my life. It's hard to kind of talk about it all <laughs> in like a two minute answer. But um, I do think it falls back on some of the basics that I was learning when I was younger. But choosing how to apply them in a practical way has been an experience and it's continue, it's going to continue to be. It's like not over. 
still in my thirties, so <laughs> um, I'm sure it will continue. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and I think the last question we have is that, is there any advice you would give specifically to Indian women who are going into STEM research? Uh, did you ever, you know, go through imposter syndrome? And if you did, how did you cope with it? <laughs> oh, okay. This is such a great topic to dive into. Um, women in STEM in general, uh, I don't like, it's so clear that there is a, there's an advantage to having women there, but um, that there are fewer numbers. I'm, it's not just specific Indian women. I think actually Indian women have a little bit of a benefit because um, uh, we're not as much of a minority compared to overall women. Like the bigger problem is women in general in STEM. Um, and there are lifestyle components to being in STEM. If you're in the tenure track process and whatnot, getting pregnant during those times, how do you take time off? How does it affect your mental health as well and all of this there is this there is this complete hormonal like pull that you have when you have a child of like whether to work or whether to be at and there's this constant guilt there's a lot that goes into Hi. it and as i'm saying this my little my little star is here too um that definitely is almost done um i think the advice that i can have is this is my my own viewpoint i was very focused on what I was doing every single time. I kind of have been a little bit like blinders on where I don't pay attention to all of these things. And my achieving, getting results or being focused on the work ethic of it really got me moving forward. I didn't, it didn't affect my, um, my, my, I don't know, my caliber of, of being able to do things when I was running a biotech, when I was starting the company, I was actually thinking that I shouldn't be the leader, that it should be somebody else who was older, probably male, and I can like move things forward. But it became very clear in all the discussions we were having in settings that everyone was turning to me to get the answers on whatever because I had the knowledge of what it was. And so when you're just focused on what you are doing, you can push through these barriers. There are barriers and can't deny that there aren't. And but it's about developing yourself mentally strong enough to not be affected by them. And then you just kind of push through them and you set an example for the next people. You need to be there to like guide the next generation, be the example that they can understand what it is there. Women who came before in STEM, being present, being in leadership roles, all of those things kind of make an impact. And so I think if, is there, if there's just one piece of advice I would say is, is just be focused on what it is that makes you happy and get the result. Like focus on that and just focus on your work and it ends up anyways um, giving you the fruits of your labor. And that's wonderful advice. Thank you so much.